I'm Marian Schubert. Uh, I'm based at the Uni uh, Norwegian University of Life Sciences, also at uh, Stockholm University. But um, the uh, <laughs> topic that I'm going to talk about today is uh, part of my PhD and postdoc that was based at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And it's the evolution of uh, tolerance uh, to temperate uh, climates in the grass of family Puida. Um, as you can judge from the picture, I will focus on cold tolerance today. <coughs> Yeah, and I always uh, like to start with the um, overarching uh, motivation, or the yeah, the overarching, uh, overarching motivation um, for our group to um, study Puida species, uh, which is really well visualized on that map here, um, showing you the percentage of grass species that belong to the um, Puida subfamily. Um, so moving from the equator towards the poles. You can see that in the grass flora, counting species, the uh, species that belong to the pre subfamily, they increase. With other words, uh, in the temperate and especially cold temperate um, areas of the world, the pre species are the dominant grasses. <coughs> and as I said, the um, uh, yeah, pre are part of the grass family, the uh, uh, poesi, um, which is a big family, 10,000 species, 12 subfamilies. Um, they are grouped into uh, three early diverging subfamilies, um, six subfamilies that are uh, grouped in the pack mud clay. There you can find all the C4 grasses, you can find maize and uh, sugarcane and sorghum there. And then the clay that we call the BOP clay with the rice, bamboos, and the poles. And of course, the poida, they harbor all the temperate cereals, temperate forage crops, economically really important. And our question is, uh, what happened from here to here that made this tropical to subtropical ancestor evolving temperate adaptations like frost tolerance, uh, cold acclimation, vernalization, day length flowering, and made it possible for this group to colonize temperate um, environments. And I uh, forgot to mention that um, all of these, or most of these uh, lineages are tropical, subtropical. Um, to study that, we need to know a little bit more about um, temperate climates. And we heard yesterday that um, the Earth climate was pretty warm before, and temperate climates are actually not that old. Uh, you can see that here um, on this graph showing you the global mean annual temperature in the past 200 million years. Um, and at the time when the angiosperms originated, global climate was fairly warm, and the temperate climates were limited, really limited, and they started to expand starting from here at that time around the Eocene-Oligocene boundary when temperatures dropped. And this boundary and temperature drop coincided uh, with an emergence uh, of temperate lineages in many plant groups. Um, that's a tree, a phylogenetic tree of 10,000 to three species. And you can see the ancestral lineages were all tropical and temperate lineages started to emerge independently of each other and approximately around the time of the Eocene-Oligocene boundary and afterwards. And this pattern you can find in many other plant groups, even in animals, in some fishes, you find that pattern. For us, the question was, okay, that seems reasonable that that is the same case for the pre um, for the temperate grasses. To answer if that was the case, we had to solve another problem first, namely the age of the grasses and the age of the temperate grasses. Um, the age of the grasses was controversially uh, was controversial before due to a lack of um, deep node um, fossils. We had quite a few fossils um, for, um, for younger nodes, but we lacked uh, really reliable fossils for the deep nodes. And I marked um, the Puide subfamily in blue here um, and show you our tree that we used for dating. Uh, and I reduced it quite a lot, so um, therefore it looks so small. So yeah, we had the problem, we lacked the fossils here, we needed to have a reliable age of the grasses. Um, luckily, when we started that project, there, has, there have been some recent um, 
fossil observations. Um, for example, that fossil here uh, is from a dinosaur coprolite uh, containing uh, epidermal fragments from a grass leaf that um, showed synapomorphies for the um, rice subfamily. Another um, really interesting fossil popped up, oh yeah, sorry, and that, that was dated uh, to 60 million years. <coughs> Another fossil that popped up is this 100 million year old um, ergot, ergot on a um, grass inflorescence that was trapped in amber. And the most exciting fossil um, was that um, fossilized dinosaur. Uh, with epidermal fragment from grass leaves lodged between the teeth of the um, dinosaur. So whenever you learned in school that dinosaurs didn't eat grasses, yeah, that might be uh, evidence against that. So uh, with two new calibration points, we were able to estimate really reliable ages um, of the whole grass family, the Praesi, and the uh, Puide subfamily. And it was much older than previously thought, 68.71 uh, million years. And when you remember the temperature curve from the beginning, uh, the Eocene Oligocene boundary, when the temperature dropped, uh, was here. And that is the time when we could show all the major lineages of the uh, grass or temperate um, grasses had diverged already. The uh, common ancestor of the um, Poeta subfamily originated at a time where global and um, climate was warm in general. Yeah, so um, we asked ourselves if they are able, if all these uh, species are able to colonize temperate climates, is the tolerance to temperate climate and cold tolerance ancestral um, for that group? For that, um, we used uh, phylogenetic comparative methods, we used ancestral state reconstruction, and used isothermality as a primer for seasonal climate. In short, isothermality is um, the ratio of within day temperature variation versus within year temperature variation. So if all the temperature variation that occurs um, is within a day in a, in a certain um, geographical area, then you have a high isothermality and you are in the tropics so there's no seasonality in the tropics. Uh, when you're in an area with uh, large temperature seasonality throughout the year, then you have a low isothermality. So we use these um, yeah, isothermality values as proxy for seasonality, plotted them on our um, phylogeny uh, of 400 Puida species with all the major tribes, Puida tribes and the outgroups. Um, and reconstructed the trait uh, along the phylogeny back in time. And we could see that the ancestor of the Puide and the ancestor of all the major tribes, the ancestors of all the major tribes, um, um, likely uh, experienced um, temperature seasonality in their ranges, whereas the um, tropical lineages and the tropical um, ancestors had a, had a, had a lower seasonality um, or had a higher isothermality value, um, which was uh, compared to the modern day world. So you can see that here it was compared to a more subtropical uh, climate, whereas the um, Puida lineages compared to a, a warm temperate um, climate. We also asked um, is the uh, tolerance to long winter, um, was that conserved in the Puida? And for that, um, we used the mean temperature of the coldest quarter as a proxy. And we asked, do the species experience mean temperatures of the coldest quarter below three degree uh, centigrade or above? So yes and no, we had a binary character. We constructed that um, on the phylogenetic tree. And we could show that uh, the ancestors of the Puede tribes and the common ancestor of the Puede likely experienced cold winters, whereas um, ancestors of all the other lineages did not. So tolerance to temperature seasonality and cold winters seem to be conserved um, or ancestral in uh, the Puede subfamily. With these uh, results, 
we ask ourselves, okay, this um, conservation that we see or this ancestral state that we see, is that also conserved on a molecular level? Is that conserved? Um, does, is the genetic basis um, conserved? And um, we did a, well, we ran a comparative transcriptomics experiment, and Sandy did a really nice um, job in explaining comparative transcriptomics. So I won't really talk you through the methods part. Um, I will focus on two key results. But just in short, um, we picked five uh, species from the, or five, yeah, um, uh, distantly related uh, species from the Poeta subfamily. Um, three species, you can see them there, uh, from early diverging lineages. Um, the model class Paripodium stachyon, which is uh, the sister species to a clade that we call Corpoida. It's a species rich clade, a clade containing all the economical important um, species. And we use barley as a reference. We grew those five species at um, six degrees Celsius. Uh, under short days, and we sampled RNA after eight hours, four weeks, and nine weeks. So we had uh, measurements of the gene expression after a short um, cold shock, if you will, and after a long-term cold treatment. So we did differential gene expression and um, compared uh, the genes that were conserved. And um, the first key result that I want to focus about is the conserved cold response of genes that we found. To my surprise, we found only 16 genes. I don't know what I expected, but in my opinion, this number was low. <laughs> uh, we found only 16 genes that um, had, the, had, had a conserved cold response uh, among these five uh, species. And conserved cold response means they had the conserved sequence and they showed the exact same um, expression pattern among all these five species. 11 of those um, 16 genes were induced in short-term cold. Uh, three of, no, four of those genes um, were induced in uh, long-term cold. So the majority of the genes was induced in short-term cold. Um, and those genes were mainly genes that were known uh, um, abiotic stress response genes from other angiosperms, so from rice, uh, um, and Arabidopsis, for example. The majority of differentially expressed genes in cold were sp uh, lineage specific, um, which shows you that, okay, there might have been an, uh, a conserved cold response in the ancestor, but a lot of um, molecular evolution in regard to cold adaptation has been going on in different lineages. Mm, the other key result from this transcript transcriptomic experiment uh, were the, um, was the target gene uh, experiment uh, of cold acclimation genes. So for you that don't know, cold acclimation is the uh, ability of plants to increase their cold tolerance um, during a period, or to increase their frost tolerance in a, in a period of um, cold, non-freezing temperatures. So the traditional example, a plant in autumn will sense cold temperatures, increase their fr uh, its frost tolerance to um, yeah, prepare for winter frosts. And luckily, uh, we had um, barley and Lillian Perenne, um, Perenne Rygas, in the experiment. And um, cold acclimation is an economically really important trait. So it's really well studied on a molecular basis in these two species that are important crop species in Europe, at least. Um, and we picked uh, nine genes uh, slash gene families that we know from these two species are crucial for cold acclimation. And we tested their conservation in um, Paripodium stachyon, the early diverging Puede species, um, and we had rice um, as, a, as an outgroup, basically, in our um, experiments. And what we found was a totally mixed picture. So uh, we found genes so three genes here that um, show an expression pattern that you would expect of a traditional cold acclimation gene. It's uh, induced during short-term cold, but it stays induced also during a long-term cold. Like after nine weeks, it's still differentially expressed uh, compared to the control. And um, this expression pattern seemed to be conserved in all our Poeta species, 
Not in rice, of course. Rice is not able to cold acclimate. Um, but in rice, these genes are known from chilling stress. So they are induced during short-term cold. Uh, we found a bunch of genes that were um, less conserved. Some of them were seem to have a cold acclimation um, type uh, response in some of the early diverging lineages. Um, some of them were only conserved in paripodium and the core poles, or only the core poles. And we, we even found an example um, of a group of genes that was not known previously to be involved in cold acclimation in the uh, crop species, but the early diverging grasses. They seem to um, use that for their cold acclimation, or at least a response to cold acclimation. Mm. I don't talk more about those genes, but they are super interesting. So if you have more questions what their function is, please uh, ask me. Um, I also don't go into gene family expansion. We also found um, interesting patterns there. Um, uh, with that, I want to conclude uh, my talk. So the age of the Puide uh, is much older than we previously thought. Although all the tribes had diverged before the expansion of temperate climates, uh, tolerance to frost and temperature seasonality seems to be ancestrally shared. We find evidence for that also in the, uh, in the, uh, on the gen genetic basis. Um, but we also see patterns that most of the cold responsiveness and most of the cold responsive genes, they seem to have evolved in the single lineages, in single tribes. Yeah, with that, um, I want to pinpoint you to the two publications. So uh, the, the dating and diversification stuff was uh, published in um, Global Ecology and Biogeography. Uh, the transcriptomic stuff was published in the Plant Fish. Um, this was a collaboration between my PhD supervisors, um, a fellow PhD student, uh, and Thomas and uh, Andrea uh, helped with the dating and diversification analysis. And I thank the New Pathologist Trust for yeah, inviting us and bringing all us together. It was a really inspiring talk. And yeah, thank you for the attention. <laughs>